We're going to read Exodus chapter 5 in a minute here. We're talking this summer or this past few weeks about how to be angry with God. There's going to be times when we are going to be frustrated with God. There's going to be times when what God says doesn't seem to happen, when our prayers don't seem to be answered, and we are going to be frustrated. So how do we deal with that? What do we do? There's examples in the Bible of people getting frustrated and angry with God. We're going to look at how these people of God of the past responded. So I'm going to read all of Exodus chapter 5, and I'm, I'm going to also read the uh, ver- first verse of chapter 6. And I'm going to read it out of the English Standard Version, so it won't match exactly the Pew Bibles there, but... Um, I I like the way that some of these words are translated here, so that's why I'm reading it out of this. Anyways, Exodus 5. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover... I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with a sword. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people away from their work? Get back to your burdens. And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land are now many. And you make them rest from their burdens. The same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their foremen, You shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks as in the past. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the number of bricks that they made in the past you shall impose on them. You shall by no means reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry, Let us go and offer sacrifice to our God. Let heavier work be laid on the men that they may labor at it and pay no regard to lying words. So the taskmasters and the foremen of the people went out and said to the people, Thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go and get your straw yourselves wherever you can find it, but your work will not be reduced in the least. So the people were scattered throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. The taskmasters were urgent, saying, Complete your work, your daily task, each day as when there was straw. And the foremen of the people of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and were asked, Why have you not done all your task of making bricks today and yesterday as in the past? Then the foremen of the people of Israel came and cried to Pharaoh, Why do you treat your servants like this? No straw is given to your servants, yet they say to us, Make bricks, and behold, your servants are beaten, but the fault is in your own people. But he said, You are idle. You are idle. That is why you say, Let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Go now and work. No straw will be given you, but you must still deliver the same number of bricks. The foremen of the people of Israel saw that they were in trouble when they said, You shall by no means reduce the number of bricks, your daily task each day. They met Moses and Aaron, who were waiting for them as they came out from Pharaoh. And they said to them, The Lord look on you and judge, because you have made a stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants, and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Then Moses turned to the Lord and said, O Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. And first verse of chapter 6. But the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them out out of this land. So in verses 22 through 23, 
we can see that Moses gets angry with God. Before this chapter, God appeared to Moses in a burning bush and said, Moses, I want you to go to Pharaoh. I want you to tell him to let my people go. And I'm going to perform some miraculous signs for you so that Pharaoh will let the people go. So go now. And Moses resisted. He went reluctantly. But he went. So he he thought, okay, God's going to deliver the people. So I'm going to go and I'm just going to talk to Pharaoh. He's going to let the people go. Moses follows God's instructions, but the result is a heavier burden. Instead of the people being let go, like God said, it's even worse now. In in this translation here, it says, get back to your burdens. Like, the people were in slavery in Egypt. You can just imagine them with these big packs on their back, trying to carry things along. Get back to your burdens. And now it's even more difficult because they have to make these burdens, these bricks, without straw. They have to somehow find straw themselves. In verse 22 there, it says, Moses turned to the Lord. This could easily be translated, Moses turned on the Lord. When you turn on somebody, that means you kind of like turn against them. You take out your frustrations on them. You turned on the Lord. Just like an animal would turn on its master. Given what Moses actually said, this kind of makes more sense. It's kind of strange that it doesn't, the text doesn't say, so Moses said to the Lord, or Moses went to the Lord. No, Moses turned on the Lord. We turn on people when we get angry, don't we? I'll never forget a story that I heard once about a student in a classroom. The teacher said something that this student didn't like, and this student decides to punch the person just sitting next to them. We turn on people when we get angry, even when it's not their fault. We even turn on our loved ones, don't we? People who are closest to us usually bear the brunt of our frustrations and our anger. Moses, he he knows the Lord. He, He loves the Lord. But he turns on the Lord. We do the same thing. We can see Moses' anger in the way he talks to God. There's some pretty rough stuff that Moses says here. Moses begins by attributing evil to God. Why have you done evil? Can you imagine saying that to God? God, why have you done evil? If you have an NIV translation, it just says trouble. The Hebrew word can mean a wide range of things, including evil. It's an interesting word choice. Why have you done evil? That's a serious statement to say against God. It kind of borders into irreverence, if not crosses that line. It's one of those things where you'd have to be pretty upset with God to say something like that. This is one of these statements where it's kind of surprising that Moses wasn't just struck by lightning right there for saying something like that. Moses gets extreme like this with God only one other time. That's in your Bible reading tracks this week. Moses attributes evil to God. He puts God in the same place as Pharaoh. Pharaoh is enslaving and oppressing the Israelites. And God is put in the same place as Pharaoh. In verse 23, it says, Pharaoh has brought evil on this people. In verse 22, God has brought evil on this people. God and Pharaoh, 
you're pretty much in the same place. This is quite a statement against God. You'd have to be pretty upset to say something like this to God, about God. And then at the end of what Moses says, he says, you have not delivered your people at all. In other words, you told me to go to Egypt. You told me to tell Pharaoh to let the people go. I did what you said. You said that you would deliver the people. You said that they would be led out of Egypt. What happened? Not that. Moses ends by telling God, you didn't do what you said. I did what you told me to do, but you didn't, say what, you didn't do what you said you would do. I kept my end. You didn't keep yours. Kind of almost calling God a liar here. There's finality in Moses' words. In the way that he speaks this, you have not delivered your people. You didn't do it. There's no room for a future change of circumstances or a bigger plan here. This is just very, this is just very straightforward frustration with God here. And what's going on? Sometimes we get angry with God because He doesn't seem to do what He says. It doesn't seem like it to us that He, will, he does what He says all the time. There are times when we will ask God and we will not be given something. We will seek and we will not find and there will be times when we knock and the door won't open right away. We know that God answers prayer and we all can tell stories about times when we said a prayer and God responded. But God doesn't always answer prayer right away, does He? There's sometimes it takes years and years and years of asking for something before God will actually come through and answer the prayer. Sometimes it seems like God doesn't do what He says. It seems that way. As believers, there will be times when we will question God's promises. If you look in the Bible, if you read the Bible, there's a lot of things God has promised us. And there will be times when we will question if God is really serious about that. Because what we're going through in a moment doesn't match with what God says. Psalm 77, 7 through 9 says this. I think I have that up there. Yes. Will the Lord reject forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? There will be moments when we will be asking these sorts of things. Does God reject his people? No. But there will be times we might ask that. Does God never show his favor again? There might be times we might ask that. Or his unfailing love vanished forever. There's kind of an oxymoron, isn't there? Unfailing love vanished forever. That's don't really go together. We know that God's unlove is unfailing, but there's times when it's like, God, where, where is that unfailing love you talked about? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he withheld his compassion and anger? Maybe you've asked these things of God before. If you haven't, there'll probably be a day when you will. These moments that we go through, these times when we wonder if God is serious about what He says or not, there will be those moments. Those times, though, 
those don't nullify the promises of God. It doesn't take them away. It doesn't mean they're false. There will be moments where we'll wonder about that, but those times don't void the promises or their fulfillment. So we know the rest of this story here. Moses didn't know the end of the story, but we do. Moses would go back to Pharaoh and there would be ten plagues and the people would be let go. And it would be a happy ending, right? But Moses was in this moment. Moses was in this moment where God had seemed to have failed, had not come through. And he was caught up in this moment, just very discouraged, very frustrated about it. Couldn't see the future at that point. We are mortals caught up in moments while God sees the big picture. And now that we can look back on this story, we can see the big picture too. It's kind of like when you look back on your life. There's a lot of times when we are really worried about things. And then later you look back and say, well, God had that all all together after all. So just for myself, there was time when I was in high school, I was really, really worried about a lot of things. I was worried about, boy, what if, what if, uh, what if I don't know what I'm supposed to do? Where am I supposed to go to college? Where, what am I supposed to do with my life? Who might I end up marrying and will it be a good marriage or not? And boy, I was worried about a lot of things. I look back at it now, I, God, God knew what he was doing there. Uh, those things I was worried about, those prayers that I was asking at that time, yeah, it all makes sense now. When you see that big picture, it looks okay. But in these moments, it's hard. It hurts. And there's disconnect sometimes between what God says and what you're going through. God has a different timeline than we would like. But he always does what he says. God always does what he says. So when angry with God, Moses didn't retreat. He turned to God. Turned on God, turned to God either way. Moses didn't go away from God. And this is something I've said in another sermon before, but I want to say it again because this is really worth repeating. When angry with God, go to God. Don't go away from God. Don't retreat from God. Go to God. If you're mad with Him or if you're frustrated with Him, go to Him. Tell Him you're mad. Tell Him what you're frustrated about. Tell Him, tell him about, hey, God, you said this, but this is what's happening. Talk to him about it. God doesn't do the passive-aggressive sort of a thing. Be, be aggressive with God. Look at how aggressive Moses was here. He has been charged God with, with evil. That's, that's serious. Go, go to God. Be aggressive. Wrestle with him like Jacob did at Peniel, if you know that story. Go to God. It's easy to turn away from God when you're mad at Him, to give Him the silent treatment. That's the, that's not, that's, that's the wrong way to handle anger with God. Go to Him. For the faithful, if you believe in God, if you trust Him, if you love Him, that means that you love the things He loves and you're angry with the things He gets angry with. For the faithful... Anger at God is actually anger alongside God. We're angry with, alongside God. We're angry at the things he's angry with. Moses really here, he wasn't angry at God. I mean, he was, but in reality, he was angry at the slavery and the situation that he's in. These are things that 
God is angry with too. This is why God said, okay, Moses, I'm, this slavery here in Egypt, this, is, this has got to stop. So we're going to put a stop to that, and I'm going to use you to make that happen. Okay? We're angry at the same things that God is angry with. There's oppression. There's injustice. There's disregarding God's word. There's wicked people who succeed. And there's righteous people who languish. This is frustrating. This is maddening. Just because God allowed Pharaoh to enslave the Israelites, that doesn't mean that that met with God's approval. God's putting a stop to it now. So God is definitely angry with sin and all of its resulting trouble. There was a time in this world when there were no problems at all. There was no trouble. But when we disobeyed God, that's when the trouble started. That's the case for us too. But God is angry with the same things that we are angry with. If you don't believe me that God gets angry, read some of the prophets. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Amos, Micah, and so forth. God gets angry, and He's angry at sin, and He's angry at all of those problems that sin causes. But Moses here, he says, God, you failed. You didn't do what you said. You said you would deliver these people, and you haven't. It didn't happen. God, I did what you said. You didn't follow through. But Moses is actually being forgetful here, which we tend to do when we get angry. When we get angry and our anxiety goes up, we tend to have this very narrow focus on just one thing. And we forget all of these other things that are going on. So Moses is kind of narrowing in on God. You didn't save your people like you said you would. But Moses is forgetting that God had said ahead of time that Pharaoh would resist. When God appears to Moses, he announces this roadblock ahead of time. So Exodus 3, 19 and 20. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. After that, he will let you go. And then again, the Lord said to Moses, When you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I have given you the power to do. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Well, what do you know? Nothing is happening here outside of what God said was going to happen. Moses is angry. And he's forgetting what God had said. When we are angry with God, we usually forget that God announces bad things are going to happen to us too. In the same way that God did with Moses, likewise for us. God announces our roadblocks ahead of time too. John 16, verse 33. This is Jesus talking. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Trouble, it's going to happen. 2 Timothy 3.12 In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It's going to happen. If it happens to you, don't be surprised. You should expect it even. Or Jesus in Matthew 10, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. You're going to have problems. You're going to have opposition. It's going to be hard. You're going to have challenges. There are going to be times when wicked seems to win. I have others here too. So we can be disappointed in these moments that we have. We can be disappointed that things aren't happening like we anticipated, but that we don't have any reason to be discouraged, do we? 
Because God says this is going to happen. We should expect this. This is not the end though. Just like it wasn't the end for Moses, this isn't the end for us either. There's going to be these moments where the bad guys seem to win. The wrong things seem to happen. But that isn't the end of the story. There's more to the story. And there's a bigger picture. And God sees that bigger picture. And we just need to wait for it. Chapter 6, verse 1, just one more time. But the Lord said to Moses, this is God's response, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. So God's answer to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. You're, you're, God's kind of saying, you're, you're in this moment right now where things aren't going like you expected them to. But you're going to see. There, there's this bigger picture here, and you're going to see it. You're, you're in this moment right now, but give it a little time, you're going to see. You're going to see what's going to happen. That's the hardest part, isn't it? The waiting, isn't it? I know some of you have been in these situations before where you're in this waiting game, waiting to hear some results from a test, waiting to see what somebody else will say, waiting to hear God answer a prayer. I've had these conversations with some of you. That waiting is the hardest part, isn't it? But it does happen. It does happen. By the time Moses gets through these ten plagues, and he leads these people out of Egypt, and they're going all the way to this Red Sea, and there's this big body of water, and now they're cornered by the Egyptians and everybody, all the people are saying, we're going to die. This is the end. God just brought us out here to let us die. And this is how it all ends right now. This is the end. By that time, Moses doesn't see the end anymore. He sees a bigger picture. So whereas here, Moses hits a roadblock and thinks, oh, this is the end. There's no more future. It's not going to happen anymore. Later, when they hit a roadblock, the Red Sea, cornered by the Egyptians who are about to slaughter them all, listen to what Moses says then. Oh, actually, I have it up here. Do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you you need only to be still. Turn around. This is somebody who doesn't see the roadblocks anymore. Here's somebody who sees the bigger picture, who knows that God is up here, and there might be these moments where we're in trouble, bad things are happening, it's not going like we want it to, or even like God wants it to, but hey, let's just wait a minute. We just wait. God is going to come through. When deliverance is impossible, and they thought it was, they end up seeing it. You will see this. And that's God's answer to us too. You shall see what I will do. You will see it. You're in this moment right now where it's not going well, but you know what? Give it a minute. You will see what I will do. You will see it with your own eyes. You're going to see how I'm going to come through. You're going to see how justice is done. You're going to see your prayers answered. You're going to see the blessing that it is to have faith in this difficult time. You're going to see it. You will with your own two eyes. Psalm 27. This, and this psalm ends this way. I am still confident of this. 
I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. It's going to happen and you are going to see it. You're in this moment, but this is just a moment. You're going to see it. God always does as he says, just add time. You know, instant lemonade, just add water. God does what he says, just add time. Just wait a little bit. Because when God is talking, nothing is too good to be true. Jesus Christ means the blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to those who are poor. And my favorite on the screen here, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. This is God talking. This is going to happen, and you will see it. We'll be in those moments, but there's a bigger picture, and we are going to see that bigger picture. Let's uh, finish by responding together to this. What do you believe in the Apostles' Creed when you say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth? That the eternal Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who out of nothing created heaven and earth and everything in them, who still upholds and rules them by his eternal counsel and providence, is God and Father because of Christ his Son. I trust him so much that I do not doubt he will provide whatever I need for body and soul. And he will turn to my good whatever adversity he sends me in this sad world. He is able to do this because he is almighty God. He desires to do this because he is a faithful father. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, in these difficult moments where it's difficult to see ahead, Lord, we will get angry and we will get frustrated with you and we'll even say some things that are not right to you. But Lord, help us to see the big picture or at least remember, Lord, that there is one. Help us to trust you and to have patience so that, Lord, your promises will come true and that we would see it. Keep those words on our minds and on our hearts in those difficult times, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.